Hello, and welcome to Research Software Hour. Hello, everybody. So this is session seven, if I count correctly. My name is Radovan. Mm -hmm. I'm calling in from Tromsø, Norway. And I'm Richard. I'm calling from Helsinki. And we're here to talk about all the stuff you need to know to do research software and computing, but no one will ever tell you. <laughs> Or maybe they'll tell you, just they won't teach you, at least not teach you the way they expect you to learn. Yes. And so today we we have a couple of interesting topics. We will we will start out with talking about the the hash bang, she bang. Or later we like the the main topic of today will be distributing software and packaging. So I will demonstrate how we package software. How we package Python code and deploy it to PyPI, the Python Package Index, mm -hmm. and we will then discuss more generally how to package software for science. Yeah, and more. Okay, so yeah, with that, should we start with the shebang? So if you look at our logo, you see it's the hash and exclamation mark. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but should oh. we maybe also remind how to find oh, the yes. share document of course. Where, where you can ask questions and where you also find links which yeah. we post during the session. Mm -hmm. So in the Twitch channel description, you see a link to a HackMD pad, which I will also paste into the Twitch chat there. Oh, so yeah. you use this to ask us question at questions and talk with us. So basically always right at the bottom, we have it open, we see, and we'll respond. Of course, you can also use the Twitch chat, but the HackMD lets us go forward and backwards in time and answer older questions. And we also archive it as part of our uh, channel posts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, any other basics? I think that's I think it. That's, yeah. I think that's good. Now back to the hash bang, which is yeah, on top of the logo. So on top of just above mm -hmm. our, our both faces. Yeah. So this is the hash bang. You have probably seen it around. Um, many of you probably already knows knows what it means, but to put everyone on an equal footing in our spirit of telling you what no one teaches you, that's what we're going to talk about first. So at first it looks like a comment and then a exclamation mark. So this is basically a marker to Unix operating systems that say this can be a script that is executed by some particular program. So let's... Um, sorry, I'm just sorry, are you now sharing screen or...? Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Mm. There, my screen is. OK. Yes, sorry about that. So the shebang. So let's make a script file. Let's call it script. I will edit it with Emacs, of course. Um, and let's put a shell command in here. Echo hello. Hello world, of course. So we're going to run this, and we want to try to execute it. What do you think will happen? How do you execute a file in Unix? Dot slash script. Um, and will this work? No. First, we get permission denied. And that's because it's not marked as executable. So we tell Unix that this should be executable, and now we can run it. But how does the operating system know what is actually going to, um, how does it know how to run it? So most programs on an operating system are compiled. So they have some binary source code, which is basically just what you do, um, like what the operating system and the hardware itself runs. But there's this concept of scripts. So if we put at the top this thing, uh, bin bash, 
So when we try to run this file, it will, the Linux kernel will open the file, look at the first two characters, see shebang, and then say, oh, this is a script. And then look at the rest of that line and use that to run it. So here I run the script. This is exactly the same as bin bash with script here. So of course, if it was not executable, which I'm doing now, you can run it with bin bash, but not uh, this way. So and probably also with bash without the bin. Yes. So we can run it, well, like that. Let's do some exploration together. Let's open up the script. Does just bash here work? What do you all think? I'm not sure. Might work. So we see bad interpreter, not bash. Mm. So what this is basically mean is it's not using the path environment variable to find where these programs are. So what would happen if we wanted to make this work on other computers where bash might be installed in a different location? Well, usually it's not, but uh, there's a trick here, which you've undoubtedly seen in other contexts. This user bin and trick with bash on the end. So what do you think this will do? Well, if we run it, it appears to work. It appears to be bash. Um, but what is this env doing? So I guess it will, it will find the first uh, first bash in the path, in the environment. Yeah. So it appears to do nothing, but in reality, it started a subshell. Let's do this with Python. So now it started Python, which is probably user bin Python. But let's load this virtual environment that we used last week. And now let's run user bin and Python. And now we've got Python 3.7.3. Uh, And now we're running Python from inside of this virtual environment. So that's why in most of these scripts, you see user bin env and the program to make it portable. So what happens if an operating system doesn't have user bin env there? What do you do? Well, I actually don't know. I guess yeah, I don't know you're just like, but I guess that's probably defined as one of the core standard, so it's always going to be there. So let's convert the script into a Python script by changing bash to Python here. Um, I will save it, and now let's run it. So what's going to happen? Well, it's not Python code, so yeah, that's about what I expected. Let's do some more edits. Uh... Let's just show that it works and run it again. Yep, it's Python now. So there is one other interesting thing you can do. What if this was a make file? So as last time, default, uh, okay. Mm, actually, I'll make a new script called make file. So, now the default rule uh, make file. So if I just type make, then it runs. But what if I run make and the make file's name? It does not work. Because make, the first argument is not the thing that's going to be executed. It's the thing that's trying to be made. So to make something, you give a dash F to it, and then make will use that particular make file. 
So let me rename this to make script. Now I can run make dash f make script. But what if you want to mm -hmm. make the make script executable? Yeah, let's try it out. So it doesn't work. Why? So actually, if you don't give it the shebang line, it tries to use the default shell on the system. Um, so actually, we didn't need to put bin bash in there. Um, so now here's a trick we can do. We give it the user of an end make and then dash f. So what actually happens is it uses the rest of this line in order to run the script. So now this we, what we see here is going to be equivalent to mm, this. So let's try to run it. Mm -hmm. And what do you know? It actually doesn't work. And this is actually a quite interesting problem. It says make dash f no such file or directory. So actually what's happening here, which took me some time to figure out, is it's running this. So everything else on the line is interpreted as one argument. Mm -hmm. And there we go. We reproduced it here. So in order to make this make script work, if we do user bin and make dash f, Uh, uh, there we go, and now it works. So what happens if we need to use user bin end to find where make is with dash f? Because clearly, you know, this option is not going to work. This is the first thing we tried. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess we're sort of um, stuck there. I guess it would be the same if you tried to patch options to bash. Dash E, uh, yeah. This is not going to work either. So that's the basics of the shebang lines. So we're uh, teaching this now in order to prepare for some stuff we do later. So in a future section, okay, I see a suggestion for check. For... Let's try it out. And really with these, also with the hash banks, that's something that, yeah, nobody explained to me. And I think when I started, I don't think Stack, stack Overflow existed. <laughs> yeah. So here we see with the extra quotes, it's still using the two quotes. So the two quotes are interpreted literally and not interpreted by there. Mm -hmm. So this is a common pattern. There's some things that are interpreted by a shell, which does like interpret the quotes and spaces and all that, and some things that are not. So this is apparently the Linux kernel is probably splitting by a single space and taking everything else and just sending it straight to uh, to the system call that's trying to start something. Hmm. So what are you making shell scripts? One thing you can do, there's bin bash, and there's also bin sh, which on some systems is the same as bash, but it can actually be something different. So on some modern systems, the default sh is more lightweight than bash. So mm -hmm. here, I do bin sh and I get something really weird because it's not understanding my bash variables properly. Mm -hmm. So this works here. But if I do bin bash, this works. So when you're making shell scripts, then um, things, well, you can think about what interpreter you're at and how portable it's gonna be. Is it gonna work in only your Linux or other Linux? So I see a great suggestion from chat to quote the whole thing. Mm. 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 Oh, but oh, you said this was command line. Mm. 
is this what you mean, what I just did here? With all the quotes. Yeah, right. So this works because here the shell, it's going through bash first, which does understand every single space in here. But within the script itself, it becomes just one thing. So if we open this up, I guess we're running out of time for this segment. Here we are in Python. I'm having it print sys.argv. Uh, mm, I run the script and we see oh, yeah. the argv. So this is what's being passed to the command. There are different individual arguments here. But if yes. I quote something, then it becomes one argument. So the shell can separate these out, but at some low level of the operating system, it doesn't do these separations. So it's the shell that has to do that before it gets there. And the shell does not interpret these things. Um, and if I do... I think this will work. Mm. That did not do what I expected. Uh, okay, actually, this does not quite work. Okay, I will stop that. So there's one more, su one more suggestion on the hacker D, and that's uh, N minus uppercase S. Uh, that's oh, no. really clever. So I guess this tells N to parse the rest of it through the shell. Uh, this is the wrong program. Here. Yeah, let's try the make file. So. Yeah, maybe not super portable, but as a temporary workaround. Yep, that's amazing. Mm. Uh, nice. So if we look at the manual page, yeah, we see there is a split string option. So okay. I guess this is not defined in the POSIX standards, so is not on other non-Linux, non-GNU operating systems. So, well, anyway. Well, thanks. I, can maybe add, I just uh, learned yeah, something I new. Add, I can also add that for those of you who write Slurm scripts mm. or or PBS scripts. One thing I didn't know for the longest time is that it doesn't have to be bash. You can write a Scrum script in Python if you want to. In fact, any language where which uh, understands lines that start with a hash as comments mm -hmm. can can do it. Yeah. Okay. So someone said it exists in core utils greater than 8.3, and 8.3 seems like it's quite old. So that's good, at least. It'll probably work on most Linux systems. What is this RM Edison? What is that? Um, it's some Debian utility that shows the version of a package in different older distributions. So here I see in stable Debian core utils is 8.30 in like the older stable 8.26 and so on. Mm -hmm. And in the newer ones, it's, well, unchanged apparently. So, yeah. So would you like to tell us about releasing Python packages now, Radovan? Yes. Okay, uh your screen, are you ready for a screen share? Ready for screen share, and uh, I will talk about uh, distributing uh, Python packages through uh, to the PyPI, the Python Package Index. Mm -hmm. And please ask questions on the HackMD and give me comments because there is not only one way to do that. There are many ways. Yeah. And also for me, it was a bit of a journey. Mm -hmm. um, here on in the HackMD on top on top of the I have a few links which I will show and also use. 
so first thing I wanted to say is that I think I have programmed Python for 10 years until I started really distributing on PyPI. That's and, basically uh, the same for me, maybe 15 years or yeah. actually almost 20, maybe 15, and, yeah. And I think for several reasons, one thing I thought that, well, maybe what I have is maybe not good enough or not interesting enough, but also it, it sounded so complicated it's, and it, mm. it sounded overwhelming because there are so many different ways and there are setup tools and this utils, and I was confused. And there are still many, many ways to do that. And um, my journey was that at some point I started uh, based on, of course, I learned from others. I didn't invent anything here. And then I wrote for myself this PyPI how to. And this is one of the many ways of do that, doing it. So what I did is really uh, writing a setup.py setup script and a, and a manifest file and and uploading it through twine mm -hmm. oh, this is what i was doing until maybe two weeks ago oh, and that's a, that's an okay way but i always wish that there was it was a bit too many steps and too many files and of course one way to react then is to create a template and that's what many people do and i think you uh, you also have that research right you have a template that yeah you reuse. i've got a standard setup.py i made a few months ago and have been reusing yeah. over and over yes so i was looking for looking whether for alternatives there are a number of alternatives and i the one tool that i want to show is flit which is very lightweight but it's not the only one. So there is also poetry. And I think poetry is great. I think poetry is a bit more powerful. But I really like that Flit is so lightweight. And in very few steps, I can bootstrap a project and I can upload it. And this is what I will show. And I, I will show that using this demo repository. So let me go in there. So I have prepared it a little bit, but I didn't. There is not much there yet. Oh, what is in here? In this demo PyPI repository, there is a readme file. There is a requirements.txt. And in there, I'm listing only two requirements. And these are the ones that, these are not dependencies of my package, but these are the tools that I will use during development. So these are only for me. And it's flipped, and I will show you how that works. And it's black, and I use now black for auto formatting. So we have that as a start. There is also this GitHub workflows. And I want to, I will explain it later, but what, what this will do is this will automatically upload the package for me every time I will um, create a new release. So I have this workflow in there, but it will not be executed because this work for this uh, GitHub action only runs when, when I create a new release. It does not run every time I push. And there is some stuff happening, but I will come back to it. I think later when we when we are ready for uploading. And I will start out by cloning it to my computer, and then we will we will add a very simple script. We will bootstrap it, and then we will try to deploy it to PyPI. Let me clone to my laptop. Git clone. All right, and I have these requirements.txt, and I will use this alias that we have defined a couple of weeks ago, uh, VE, which for me, it sets it sets a virtual environment up for me based on the requirements.txt. And now I'm basically installing Flit and Black. Right now, Black is not so important, but the, uh, I will not focus on auto formatting, but I will focus on the, on the Flit. And the link is also in the HackMD. So I will, I will be using this uh, Flit Redox.io. So that's the one. Simple way to put Python packages and modules on PyPI. And it's my personal favorite now. But, but again, there is also poetry, which is also looks really, really nice. OK, back to my terminal. What do we have here again? Not much. I will now create a script and let, let's give it a name. Let's call it Reset Software Hour. Uh -huh. I have 
problem in my I have a problem on this computer. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm missing a package. This is because I switched to a different editor. So a little a little excursion here. <laughs> All right, back to let's call it resource software hour. We have seven and test.py. You're making a new file to add to it. Yes. I will create a new file to keep it really simple to show that one can even uh, package even with one single script. Um, it doesn't have to be really a Python package with many modules. Mm -hmm. I could do that too. So if I wanted if I wanted several modules, I will create a directory called and inside I will put a double under in it. And then I could collect the modules. But now I want to keep it really, really simple. Only I will, I will have only one script. So I'm editing the script and inside I will add a function called something. I want to verify that we are really calling it. We are calling the something function. And just for fun, I will also add a main function and we'll see how that can be interesting. Mm -hmm. Because now imagine that this is a more real life script, but I wanted to keep it really simple. So my Python package that I will deploy will contain these two functions. All right. And now I can do, I will bootstrap this I will use split to bootstrap all the files that I need. And we will see that there's actually only one file uh, to package the code. It will ask me a few questions. The module name, I'm happy mm -hmm. with it. Author, email. Oh. Homepage, mm -hmm. homepage, let's use, let's use, uh, what was it? Maybe this one here, the GitHub yeah. page. Mm -hmm. Which license? I don't know. Let's take MIT. And what it did now is it created a file called pyproject.toml. And that's the more modern. So that's the follow up of setup.py. It's more general than setup.py because now you can build Python project with something else than setup tools. Is this something specific to Flit, or no. is it supported in other stuff too? No, that is also supported. So also Poetry uses it, and it is. So there is a Python enhancement proposal. I don't know, five hundred seventy-one. I, I forgot the number, but mm -hmm. it's now in the standard. So you can use this also instead of setup.py, even if you use if you continue use setup tools. It's mm -hmm. more general. Yeah. Okay, it it added the license for me. That's nice. It added this uh, pipe project, and we will have a look at that. And it oh, this is my file. And now what I can try to do is I can try to do uh, flip install simlink, and this this will install the package into my virtual environment but symlinking it so it's a bit equivalent to oh uh, if you if you do pip install dash e mm -hmm. okay the so they have that yeah yeah so that's great for development and it will complain it will complain because it needs a doc string mm -hmm. in my module somewhere so i need to yeah. add a doc string i guess that's overall a good thing it gets yes. you to add Yep. So that's a good thing to have the doc string. Now it will complain again, and it will complain about the version string. That's also a good thing to have. And I will add that to the also to my script. What is really nice is that Flit will be able to infer that version from my package. I don't. Yeah. I don't have to keep it in several places. That's quite nice to be able to detect this automatically. It makes me happy. Yeah. 
And I haven't I haven't found another tool which does it so nicely in one place because it always annoyed me that I had to define it in setup to py or I had to do some contraptions to uh, to get the information mm -hmm. to keep it only in one place. Yeah. But now now it will work. It installed it, and I can just to show I, I will step out of this folder and try it out here locally. Python import, what was it called? RSH7 test. And now let's try RSH7 test underscore version. Seems to work. Mm -hmm. Let's Looks call good. something. And let's call main. And it works locally. Yeah. OK, but now we want to, so that's nice. Um, all right. Now before, back to the back to the uh, folder. Before I try to do the upload, I want to do one more thing, two more things. I would like uh, when I successfully upload the code, I would like it to display the README also on the Python package index. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And I forgot how to do that, but I will consult the documentation um, here. Readme.md here. I want to add this. So it seems that pip can install stuff with the pyproject.tumble file now. Yes. Okay. Yes, it can. And I will show that because that's something I anyway like to do. I always like to I, I like to test the pip install on my mm -hmm. computer before I upload mm -hmm. it to PyPI. So yeah. I try to install it from one folder to another. Mm -hmm. And I will try that. It's always a good sanity check. Yeah. Especially when you especially for dependencies. Mm -hmm. This is how I will try to zoom in a bit here. If, if I wanted to have dependencies in there, this is how I could also uh, document them. Mm -hmm. And then a the question is, uh, should I list the versions or not? And I think we will come back to that in a moment when mm -hmm. in, in your in your session. Yeah. In this case, I will uh, I will not add dependencies. Okay, I added that. Uh, yes, I want to add one more thing. And that is, I I need to check in another program of mine how I did that. This is another project, but because I forgot, but I will copy paste. I want to use this. This is very nice. I will show you what that is. Mm -hmm. In in my in the Py project, okay, I want to call it my script. And it will be reset software R7 test. What this will do is it will create a script entry point and call the main function. And this can be really nice if you want your Python script to be uh, to have a command line interface, to be like a tool. Mm -hmm. I will show you what that does. Uh, flip, install. And now if you do my script, that's the one I defined. It actually calls, calls the main function. And then you could add a command line interface to it. I will now leave it out for simplicity. Mm -hmm. And now we are all, I think, ready here. So I will stage the changes. Git add minus u, I use that a lot. This will stage all unstaged changes. Git commit minus v. Just quickly browsing. So there's the license. We have the pipe project toml, and we have the code. Um, yeah, about to try upload. Git push origin master. I'm now pushing the code to, to the repository, but it will, this GitHub action will not do anything. Hopefully. I could now, um, a reasonable thing to do would be to add tests. But we, we did that last time. I will not do it again. So last time we did automated testing. That would be a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. In this simple case, I, I don't have 
automated tests. But now let's have a look at the at the workflows. What do we have here? So I have one that I call package. It will only be run once I create a release. We will do that in a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm also running it only on Ubuntu and only on Python 3.6. And this does not mean that this package will only work on these two. In this case, it only means that I'm generating the package on this environment. And in this case, it will not matter because it's a source package. If you wanted to build, well, maybe later I can show some other session, I can show how I'll build Rust code and with a Python interface mm -hmm. and then upload to PyPI and then I build it on, then I need to build it on different platforms and different versions. In this case, it doesn't really matter much. So what do we do? We check to check out the, the branch. I set up the Python environment. I install requirements.txt. So this will install Flit. And this is all I need to, to upload to PyPI. Flit publish. I could run it on the command line. Or then I would provide it with the password for the uh, Python package index. What I personally prefer to do, I prefer to use tokens. So this is a secret token. Mm -hmm. And and also here, just for testing, because I don't want to now put a half-baked <laughs> package on, on the real PyPI, what I like to do sometimes is I like to upload to the test PyPI. So you can do that until you know that this is working, and then, then you can comment out this line. And what is the secret? This is really nice because on on GitHub, you can, and don't worry, I will not show you the actual token, but here on GitHub, you can manage secrets and you can give it a name. And I can give, I give it a name PyPI token. And this is then a per mm -hmm. project uh, token so that I don't have to use my actual PyPI password. And later I can revoke the token again. Okay, but back to, are we ready to try it out? I think uh, looking at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I was thinking that I should also, because I forgot to show that something I always like to do. Maybe I can show it really quick. I will deactivate. Something I always like mm -hmm. to do is I try to, I make a new directory called delete me. Mm -hmm. I create a pristine virtual environment. And then I always try to do this to install right. it on the same computer. And and then I also try it out. I will now not do it for time's sake. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good thing to do. All right, test by PI. Yes. Let's create a release. Releases. Create a new release. Mm -hmm. So this is basically making the annotated tag, right? Yes. Initial version. I give it a number and I give it, I can give it some description in Markdown. And once I click on publish release, okay, release is done. But now let's look at the actions. Now the actions start doing something. Mm -hmm. Here is one. And this is my Ubuntu 3.6. And here are the steps. And this will really take only a couple of seconds. It installs the Python dependencies. Oh, it does the publish step and it's done. And now, <laughs> test by PI, let's see. Test by PI search project. What was it called? RSH7 test. Here is our Python package. Nice. There is the description, the readme. I could now install it from the test by PI. Oh, if you have dependencies, if your package has dependencies, be careful because then it might not work on the test by PI because if your package has dependencies. Installing oh, they, it might not work. Installing it might not work, right? Mm -hmm. Because then the dependencies might not be available here. So then uh, this test on your local machine is a better test. 
but I use the PyPI test to verify the GitHub action. Mm -hmm. And now every time I do a release, it, it does it automatically. I don't, I don't have to worry about it. There is no extra step for me. Yeah. Me. Was, so. Oh, yesterday I read a fun sentence on Twitter, and it was somebody was complaining that sharing Python packages is too easy. And because it's so easy, there are so many half baked packages <laughs> out there. I found it funny. But I think we should yeah. not be worried of, we should not hesitate to share our codes. Yeah. Although I made a note to say, maybe if you do share something that's not quite there, make sure, well, don't take good names for throwaway packages. Like right. if I was doing some research paper project, I'd choose some long name that wouldn't conflict with what anyone else would want and not take something like, well, I don't know, yeah, something that's really short and obvious. Because once you upload this name, if it didn't exist yet, then this name belongs to you. You can delete the project again, then the name can be reused, but the number cannot, cannot be reused again. Which also means that if you test this, uh, make sure that you, I don't know, bump here, be a bit careful with bumping these numbers because mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot reuse the same thing again. Yeah. Also, what I sometimes do for testing is uh, you can also pip install from GitHub. So sometimes I put packages mm. there until they stabilize a little bit, and then I right. Them there. Yeah, I do that a lot too. I'll just have it on GitHub and then say pip install uh, git plus https and the GitHub URL, and then that works well enough for basic things. Um, and also you have the GitHub tags to version it and so on. So I really haven't gone beyond that for some things. Mm -hmm. So my question to you now is how stable is this? So I notice in the pyproject.toml there's tool specific metadata. So even if pyproject is a general file now, is this going to be usable by anything other than flip? Oh, and where was I? Yes. Um, um, Actually, I guess this relates to what we'll talk about next some, so maybe. Yes, so this, this, is, oh, yeah. this was actually the goal also of the Pi project to allow these. So these are compatible. Here one could have uh, mm. a meta, one could have configuration for uh, linting. Mm -hmm. So this, was, this is also the idea of the Pi project, that not only a more general building, but also you can collect mm. and so I it, see. It is uh, compatible with other tools. Yeah, so it has so it has to install Flit Core with some version in order to build mm -hmm. the thing. But I guess that Flit dependency is only for the build system and right. doesn't conflict with other stuff. So correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really nice. Seems reasonable. And yeah. I like that I have only one more file to add, not not like several, not like manifest and setup and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. We are 15 minutes past. I took yeah. it longer than planned. So I don't see many questions in the HackMD or in the chat. Uh, any questions or comments before we go on? We can also come back to these questions at the end, but we really appreciate questions or yeah. um, the, really, this is not the only way of doing this. So if you have found a really nice way of dealing with uh, PyPI, at some point we should also yeah. talk about Conda, but uh, I didn't mm -hmm. want to talk about mm -hmm. Conda packaging is something I haven't done. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to hear about. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, maybe let's go on. We can go to all the questions at the end. So do you think we should go to the packaging for science? I guess that's what would make the most sense yeah, now. I think so. Yeah. OK. I will switch to my screen share here. Mm. And maximize this. So yeah, so in this HPC Kickstart course I was giving, I needed to 
introduce people to, well, applications on HPC. I wanted to make some sort of point about how important it is to package them so it's easy to install and be reused. So I ended up making this page. So it basically says what you can do to make sure that someone else can install your software on a cluster and actually reuse it. So it really relates to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, but is more focused on things like dependencies and versioning and things like that. So there's a really great talk here. Um, is this in this link is in the HackMD, isn't it? Oh, I'm, yes. I'm not adding it there. At the top, it there. it's there too. I will add it in a moment. Okay. Um, Maybe it is on top. Yeah, I put it there in the top at the start. Oh yeah, there is. So anyway, this video is 20 minutes long and is really, really funny. So I'd recommend taking a look at it. So yeah, so the point of this page is what to, like some very high level things, what to do. So when you're releasing software, first is use proper tools. So if it's a Python package, release it via pip or conda or something. Don't have your own custom installer that you have to download and run. Why is that? Because you want using your software to be interesting and installing it to be boring. Because boring means people don't have problems doing it. <laughs> Any comments here? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah, you, do, you don't want the installation to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. OK. Mm, so that's the first. Next is minimize dependencies. So this might be slightly controversial, but whenever I make something, I don't want to go and depend on all kinds of stuff that has no purpose because everything I depend on is something else that can go wrong. Of course, if I try to re reinvent things myself, then that's something else that can go wrong. So I try to use dependencies where it makes sense, but high quality ones and stable ones more than anything. We're going to get to that a little bit in the future, maybe the next one. But I'll sometimes go through a little bit of extra effort to avoid depending on some trivial thing that I could somehow work around myself. What do you yeah, think of this? Really bit me in the past was depending on boost. Uh, it's super useful, the boost library in C++. Mm -hmm. But it's a heavy dependency. Yeah. So once you have dependencies, then don't pin them too strictly. And this is a sort of also controversial. And we were discussing earlier in the week, should you depend pin them and how should you? And what does so, it mean to pin? Uh, yeah. So basically it means that when you have a library, should it say I need exactly this version of this dependency or am I flexible in what I take? So for example, on our cluster, I was trying to install something for someone and it was some um, community detection library, some network science package. And I would install it and then suddenly a bunch of other stuff that was installed in this virtual environment got downgraded. And I said, oh, this does not look good. So I go and look at the package and it's pinned, well, some basic stuff for some versions that were several years old, even though the package is currently being developed. And then basically for every dependency, it said, this is exactly what I want. So that works if I'm installing this alone in its own environment. But when I was trying to make a um, very wide ranging environment that could have everything that everyone would need, then this just doesn't work out. So in the end, I chatted with the maintainers some, they tried to make it a little bit less strict, but in the end, I just removed it because it wasn't worth the difficulties. If I install this now, then I'll be upgrading and suddenly in a few years, then it's going to start causing conflicts. And then my environment itself won't be reproducible because all of the things I've tried to install in it are now mutually conflicting somehow. 
But this is, as someone in the HackMD is saying, it's a question of libra library versus environment. So when I'm doing my own research in an environment, that's where I can pin the dependencies. So I say I install these versions, all, all of these packages. My solver has already said they're all compatible, and then it will stay the same even in, well, years in the future. Um, yeah. So it's really about, um, I think for, for me, the question is, uh, can I, will I probably use this tool in isolation? Mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's good to pin them yeah. for reproducibility. Is this tool probably going to be used with a lot of other tools in combination, otherwise not useful? Mm -hmm. Then, then it's, then it can be problematic, yeah. but I'm, I'm really unsure about my own codes. Should I put it there or should I not put it, yeah. put it there? I guess what I often do is I don't put it there and I just accept things might randomly break, but that's sort of the cost of maintaining stuff and upgrading it. And well, this works for stuff that I actually still use enough to actually find these fast enough. Um, yeah, we had a really good question. So if you put the dependencies there, then it will probably st still work in if you pin the dependencies, it will probably still work in five years with those, but it won't be compatible with tools that are five years newer. But if you don't put it there and you don't maintain it, then in five years, you'll install it and something will have changed and it won't work anymore either. Mm -hmm. So which is better? Um, and my solution to this paradox was just that things don't work unless you maintain them in the future. So the environment would work, but a general purpose tool isn't going to work. Hmm. It's sort of the same with your other dependencies. So if your dependencies have dependencies of their own, which are, they pin very strictly, then you can't use that with anything else. So for example, like as Radovan said, if you make your own tool and you pin stuff, then that works alone, but you should not expect anyone else to want to use yours as a dependency for their project. So it's basically a leaf of the node or of the mm. tree, or is it actually the root of the tree? I guess it's the root. Yeah, I still think that most of us, I'm not sure, but I still think most of us will create tools and scripts which are maybe not libraries. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not a concern, but but for some of us it is a concern. Yeah. For those creating frameworks libraries, they need to be very careful about that. Yeah. What about stuff that's put on PyPI? I'd say if it's on PyPI, you're telling someone that this might be installed along with anything else on PyPI. And there I'd expect dependencies to be as flexible as possible, or hope they would be. And if it's not if it's something that would just be installed independently, then well, I'm just as happy saying, telling someone to clone it from Git and run it. Hmm. Now, I guess you can tell I have sort of strong opinions here, having wasted far too many days of my life debugging stuff that just doesn't install together anymore. Hmm. Yeah, of course, we have uh, a different perspective also as uh, being on clusters and preparing software for users. Yeah. So next is be flexible on dependencies. So when you make a new project, you know that some older version of your dependency might not work anymore. So what do I do? Do I say, well, I know it works with version 2.5 of NumPy, so let's pin 2.5 or greater. Or do I... Um, do I just leave it at NumPy and we'll figure out what the older feature would be? Like what the, do I leave it empty or do I go backwards in time and try to find the oldest version it works with? So what I'll usually do is when starting, just leave it undefined because, well, it doesn't matter right now. But if I ever need to use it with older versions, then I might go and figure out what the requirements are and update them. Mm -hmm. Really what I might do is look at what I'm using and see what I think might be new, look at when it got added via the NumPy change log, and then 
pin to that version or greater. Or actually what I do is that I see, do I really need this feature and then write it another way so I can use an older version of NumPy even. Because yeah. a little bit of my time can save other people a lot of time. But I've also been in a situation where uh, the code simply didn't work anymore mm -hmm. because because the dependencies have changed mm -hmm. and it never mm -hmm. happened. And what I had to do then is to find out when right. was this code not modified. Aha, uh -huh, it was 2012. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go and see at which version uh, was NumPy mm -hmm. in December 2012 and, and at which version was Pandas in December 2012. That was also not so mm. much fun, but it was possible. So yeah. then I could it out and uh, pin them. Yeah, that's a good while point. reproducing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it would be nice if PyPI had a way to install versions of packages as they existed on a certain date. So it wouldn't take anything that was newer than a date. So then you could easily go back in time to a certain time, which would get around this unpinned problem. Yeah, I wonder whether this exists, and, and if it doesn't, why why yeah. does it not exist uh, such an option? Yeah. At least Debian has a snapshot that debian.org, which you can use the packages that existed on a date in the past, which is kind of nice. Hmm. Okay, let's go on. So have some tests. So if someone's trying to use your software, at least it would be good if when they install it, they can tell if it works right. So think that someone who's not the primary user is installing this, and they don't know if it works or not. They're just going to tell the person that requested it, it's installed now, I hope it works, but I haven't tested it. So that's good to do. Don't expect the latest operating system. So there was a particular tool someone needed and it would basically only work on the latest Ubuntu and not just latest long-term support, the latest of everything. So any, every time an Ubuntu came out, he would upgrade and use features from all of the latest libraries that were included in there. And then it became a huge pain to use on our cluster because all of these dependencies had to be basically rebuilt from scratch for our cluster. Eventually we switched to use containers and singularity for it but then it can't be used along with other stuff as easily. A container doesn't substitute from being able to install things. Going along with that is testing on different uh, versions of your main things, like say older Python versions, older NumPy versions, and so on. Um, but also adding um, about the not using the latest operating system so just to give a different, different perspective also from the perspective of a developer, I think I have been over the years a bit too conservative because I was very mm -hmm. concerned about it. Mm -hmm. And I, did, I wanted to support not the latest standard in, I don't know, Fortran, C++, mm -hmm. not the latest libraries, not the latest tools. Yeah. And I think I have also suffered because of that. And mm -hmm. like in recent years, I have relaxed a bit because I thought yeah. that actually not not so many people are using the code as I was concerned. <laughs> yeah, I optimize for my quality of life. So mm -hmm. in, in recent years, I'm trying to be less concerned about it, and I go for the more recent standards. Yeah, but so, also this is a, this is different. Whether I mean, if you have ten thousand users, <laughs> it's a different mm -hmm. different thing. So how recent do you go? So what I wrote here is my general policy: is I try to make it work without any special things on Debian and Ubuntu from the stable version that existed one year ago. So basically give one year for people to upgrade and then use newer stuff. Yeah, so I I now use C++11. I don't worry about it. I use mm -hmm. recent CMake, CMake 3. I really, I don't want to maintain CMake 2. Mm -hmm. I, Fortran 2003 and later. Yeah. And I know, that, I know that it will, for some users, they will have to, they will have trouble and then, then, they, then they will ask the uh, the supercomputer people to install it. So it will, <laughs> it will anyway boomerang back to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. But at least the development experience is better. Yeah. And I mean, those are not really that new. Like, um, 
C++ 11 is, well, that's plenty of time to be able to use that. So, yeah. And then also languages like, I don't know, Rust, I'm, I'm less worried about it. It's mm -hmm. I can package it also with a Python interface and, and it's not too hard to install either. There is Conda. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so last one here is the container does not replace good packaging. So if your only way of supported way of using this is get this Docker container, whatever, then um, well, that's not going to be easily, you can't easily mix it in with other stuff, which is an issue. Okay. And these other topics are just standard software things, which you don't really need to, not really specific to this. But what I really get out of this is I try to use a ecosystem which values backwards compatibility, which I think is one good thing about Python. So except for the Python 3 thing, it really does try really to go to great lengths to avoid breaking compatibility, which is a good thing, which means I can leave my versions relatively free and I don't have to worry about things. But if, um, if I use something which I know breaks like changes all the time, then I just have to know that what I do is probably not going to work in um, 10 years without me doing some sort of maintenance. Mm. Yeah, there are and, projects that, that move so fast that you have to run behind them all the time. Otherwise, yeah. it stops working very yeah. quick. Yeah. And it's really a question of do you work in isolation or do you combine your tool with other tools? So then it has to be a bit more flexible in things. So yeah, that was my rant about making software that is easy to, or well packaged and easy to install and maintain. I must say I haven't regretted being very um, flexible on my dependencies and trying to always care about backwards compatibility because I want people to use my stuff. But, you know, there are other types of development where there's different mm -hmm. priorities and that's fine too. I mean, I'll often start and not care and just use latest versions of things. And if it becomes popular or released, then I will make stuff more flexible. Exactly. Because... You will then hear from the users. So then you see via issues yeah. and then you can adjust. Mm -hmm. So also not to be too general from the start. I think yeah. it's good to optimize for like shipping it and then you can always yeah. generalize it or... Yeah. So okay. we have this other topic, which is very interesting, but we never, we always run out. So it's this a blob paradox, but we will talk about it at some point. Yeah. It's really an interesting topic, but we have to postpone it yet again. I think we mm -hmm. are carrying it for the last three sessions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's an interesting topic coming up, but I think next, next time. Okay. We are also, we got a question, which is a bit non-technical. Are we planning for a summer break? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Uh, so we, I yeah. think we will. Yeah. I haven't thought of this, but it might be a good idea. Yeah. Or at least at some point, I might be somewhere where I don't have my broadcasting computer, and that will require some changes and stuff. Yeah. So maybe July or something. And then we could also use the time to advertise more and regroup. Yeah. Collect feedback. So we always welcome questions, especially difficult questions that we cannot answer. Also, input on topics. Uh, I would mm. really like to do this binderizing. So if somebody has a mm, Python mm. R something scripted or some like Jupyter notebook visualization, mm -hmm. something like visualization plotting, that's really great for binderizing. We could yeah. do that together. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a few epilogue discussions to talk about, I guess we can conclude for the night and then I'll ask these things. Sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks for watching and hopefully see you next week.
hopefully so we're on next week because I plan on being on vacation next week. And I had just assumed that we'd figure out some way to do this, but actually that, hmm. Yeah, no stress. We will let you, everybody know through Twitter. Yeah. Um, we find out we need to yeah. discuss. Thanks so much for watching. And now we can go into the epilogue. Yeah. So one of my questions was about GitHub Actions and what the triggers are. So have you deciphered how to trigger something on pushes and pull requests? So if it's a pull request, I'll need trigger on the merge commit. And if it's a push, then it's not a pull request, then trigger just on that push. Or maybe it doesn't matter. Like maybe you just do for pull request, you trigger on the merge commit and on the... Yep. Um, so that's what I do for testing. And this is what I used last week. So there I have a, the trigger is either push or pull request. Mm -hmm. So either me pushing to the master branch or to any branch. No, actually to the, you can, you can define the branch. So you can say me pushing to the master branch mm -hmm. uh, or somebody else sending a pull request. And that I like to use for testing. Mm -hmm. And then for the packaging, typically it's a release. I yeah. haven't really explored much more. I mean, one can do much more. So I like next steps is maybe to use it for documentation or building documentation. Right. Yeah. I haven't done that yet. Yeah. yeah like these workflow syntaxes, I've read it and have tried to use it, but well, I mean, I have used it, but there's still these kind of questions, which I wish I had some better examples of. Mm -hmm. But I guess we'll figure that out later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I see one more note here in our epilogue discussion. This commit message is starting with a file name. Mm, yeah. What did you mean by that? So when I make a commit message, I usually prefix it with the file name. So for example, um, I'm switching back to my screen here. Yes, this is it. Um, so git add script. If I git commit it, I will say script. Add a demonstration of, mm, what is it? Shebang. Mm -hmm. And actually, let me clone something else here. Uh, this is something I've been doing a lot with lately. This is actually the um, this is what you see here, the rskcomp.alto.v site. So here, if you look at most of my commits, you see Triton Tutorials Interactive. And then mm -hmm. what I do, uh, the research software engineer section, what I've done, the kickstart colon, what I've done. This isn't a full path, but the concept I've been working on, these two files and what I've done. So do you think mm -hmm. this is a good idea? So how do you use it really? I like to find so that you can, if you do git log like this, you can mm -hmm. easily see. So it's more right. It's and more descriptive than. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other option is if I just said miss revisions, then that's um, not really descriptive. I could do miss revisions of this, but then I figured why not put the file name at the start so it's easy to scan down the topic and then what I do. Mm -hmm. But when, like in this project, everything is so unrelated. If you don't say what file you're working on, the commit message doesn't really make any sense, really. Mm -hmm. I could search the log and find things. For smaller projects, I will just not really um, yeah. comment so much. 
like I'll just say what I've done. Like if it touches every file in the project, then of course it doesn't matter. Um, I haven't so used it. What, yeah. what I use from time to time is uh, git log stat or git log one line stat. Mm -hmm. And when I'm interested in uh, git log dash dash one line dash dash stat. Yeah, so I do use the stat a lot also, but then it's harder to scan down. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is good if I want to search in here for when I modified some file like. Yeah. So here I can scan down and in the stat I can, actually the stat doesn't have the whole file name here, so it actually doesn't find it. But this is because you have the graph also there. Mm. Maybe. Yeah, so I think it can be useful. Yeah, yeah this so is here what I it's do. got the whole file name, yeah. Or I do git log directly on the file, and mm -hmm. then I see only the history of that file. Yeah. But most of the time I... So it, for me, it's not so important for searching the log, but for understanding the one line log and being able to understand what I'm doing. Uh, I think in, in this case, it makes sense. So yeah. I, I had never tried it, never thought about it, but it... I think it does make sense. Yeah. It does take up a lot of space if it's a really long thing. Like here, this is using up most of the space for something that's um, sort of has no purpose. But in this case, the rest of the message was short, so it was fine. But and maybe for like documentation repositories you know. like this one. Mm -hmm. uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Because most commit messages will be, I don't know, improving documentation, but uh, you you can really infer a lot from the file name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I've seen also projects where uh, people put initials into the commit message. Mm -hmm. That's also very useful. But I also see projects where which they annotate commit messages like bug fix or Mm -hmm. Enhancements, yeah, or so that you can quickly see how important or what that, mm -hmm. what the impact of that commit is. Mm. That's a nice idea. So, initials is nice because it's really short, and then the one line log gives you a really quick summary of what's going on. Um, I also have some common things like I might give the file name colon bug fix colon typos or white space or something like that to indicate how important it is to, but yeah. Mm. And if it's a project where it's touching multiple files or the file name isn't descriptive, I would give the topic like, um, say, exporting colon, like fix something something, or mm. like CSV input colon read something. So there it's not the file name, but the, well, subject of the sentence, you could yeah. say. And and it's it's really good to have a descriptive first line of the commit. Mm -hmm. uh, because then often on like GitHub, GitLab site, it's the first thing we see. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the line where we decide, should I click on it or not? Is this something for me or for somebody yeah. else? So it's really good to opt to make it descriptive in that one line and then add more context uh, mm. later. If it also yeah. depends how the project uh, agrees on, on working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a contributor guide, but you know. Okay. Anyone else have questions? So today very few questions. And, yeah. Mm, mm. Can someone give a question which we certainly don't know the answer to, so we have to research it some. Those are always fun. No. Well, maybe we should hang up for the day. Sounds good. So thanks again, Richard, and thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. 
Oh, there's maybe something. There's something. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bit outside of the scope. Someone asked, they could ask for P and NP. Okay, well, thanks a lot, everyone. See you maybe next week or maybe after summer. I guess that's a possibility too. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye.